As we mark the first year anniversary of Dobbs, we have to remember that the fall of Roe was not the beginning. From Interfaith Alliance, this is State of Belief. This is the result of a 40-year campaign led by white Christian nationalists seeking to co-opt a particular understanding of Christianity to further their political agenda. I'm Interfaith Alliance President Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch in New York City. The Supreme Court's Dobbs ruling, striking down Roe v. Wade on June 24, 2022, shocked a lot of Americans. But it shouldn't have. Most analysts agree the current court was assembled to deliver exactly this decision on exactly this issue, to strike down a constitutional right to reproductive rights. While the campaign to Dobbs was primarily driven by religious values held by a minority, countless of faith leaders and communities have stepped into the chaos that followed the ruling to support and defend those most cruelly affected by it. Taking a leading role has been the Spiritual Alliance of Communities for Reproductive Dignity, or SACRED. Organizers, religious leaders, academics, and congregations are working together to advance the cause of reproductive freedom. As we reach the one-year anniversary of Dobbs ruling, I'll be talking with the Reverend Angela Tyler Williams, SACRED's co-director for movement building. Every generation carries the responsibility to be that sort of founding generation, to have that founding ethos to sort of reinforce and renew the institutions that that allow us to have a voice in how we're governed and how we live. It would be great to put off all election talk, at least after the summer, but there's no way that's going to happen. And so we've got an obligation to talk about the values that are driving American electoral politics, especially the religious impulses that are such a big part of that. On this week's show, I'll be joined by Aaron Dorfman and Sophie Hersher andofsky from A More Perfect Union, the Jewish Partnership for Democracy. They will be offering insights on lessons learned in 2022 and how they will likely apply to what's happening in 2024. This month starts a new era for State of Belief. We're partnering with Religion News Service, the leading religion journalism organization in the country, for distribution and expansion of the show. We hope that the important conversations we produce each week will reach new audiences and contribute even more to the search for strategies and solutions to the very real challenges facing our nation. Please be sure to subscribe to the new and improved podcast called The State of Belief at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform or at stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. We've got so much planned for the weeks and months ahead, and I don't want you to miss out. Subscribe to The State of Belief today. The State of Belief is made possible in great part by the generous support of our listeners. If you've made a donation, thank you for helping get these conversations heard by more people who need them. If you haven't pitched in yet, information on how you can keep this show on the air is available at stateofbelief.com. And you can find out more about the work of Interfaith Alliance and join us in that work at interfaithalliance.org. And now to my first guest. The Reverend Angela Tyler Williams has been a regular guest on this show, dating back to her important work in faith-based organizing at the Texas Freedom Network. A passionate advocate for LGBTQI plus inclusion and dignity, Angela is now co-director for Movement Building at SACRED, Spiritual Alliance of Communities for Reproductive Dignity. And it's perfect that she's with us on the one-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision. Reverend Angela, welcome back to the State of Belief Radio. Thank you, Paul. It is so good to be with you for the first time, but to be with State of Belief again. Well, the attack on reproductive freedom, reproductive justice, feels like also a spiritual crisis for a lot of women and um, people who are faced with all of a sudden, someone is telling me what to do with my body. And I I just wanted to start actually recognizing this momentous decision, talking about the organizing and the movement building that you're doing, but also recognize you are a pastor. Mm -hmm. And my guess is that you've had to talk to a lot of people over this last year about 
what it feels like to have someone tell you what to do with your body? Yeah. Thank you for this question. At Sacred, we talk about weaving together our faith story and our reproductive story, free from shame, judgment, and stigma. And we talk about everyone in this country has a faith story, even if they don't belong to a particular congregation or tradition, because of the Christian hegemony that just exists in the air that we breathe in the United States. And everyone has a reproductive story even if they have never parented children, even if they have never been pregnant, even if they have never terminated a pregnancy, everyone has a reproductive story because who you are, where you came from, your own birth, you came into this world in a particular place at a particular time, belonging to particular people. And that is a part of your reproductive story. Unfortunately, the The powers that be in this world have told us that we need to keep those separate and that our our sex and our spirituality cannot live together in harmony. And that's simply not true. There's been so much damage and wounding that has happened um, at the personal and spiritual level, as well as the political level for so long. And so what we're trying to do at Sacred is to create and hold space for people to bring these parts of themselves together, creating healing and wholeness in a world that is still trying to keep us separated from each other and from different pieces of our own story. Mm, Gosh, it's so beautiful and so needed. You know, it's, it's, I, I like to tell the story of my own mother, who was a contraception and and reproductive justice worker back in the 60s and 70s in Wisconsin. And she was also a Presbyterian and leader in her church. So I always kind of thought these things went hand in hand. And it was like, oh, you know, I I grew up in a church that talked about reproductive uh, rights and uh, reproductive freedom. So it is, uh, it's always, you know, it's, it's struggling. It's a struggle for all of us to make sure that these things, we have a holistic approach. And right Mm now, um, the truth is, is that there's a lot of control that's being exerted on our minds, on our spirits, and on our bodies. And I wonder what changed for you, for sacred, for for other um, reproductive freedom activists who, after the Dobbs decision? Yeah. I'm going to start connecting my own story with yours first, Paul. Um, I am a Presbyterian pastor and born and raised Presbyterian, and I was raised in the South. And what that meant is I went to my church and I knew that we weren't like the evangelical churches around us, that, that we took the Bible seriously, but not literally. And that was okay. Um, I was never taught to hate LGBTQ people at all. Um, but, but beyond that, I didn't really know what it was that we did stand for. Um, and, and it was actually, I did a service year after college and I lived in the Philippines for a year and it took me moving across the world and getting so outside of the world that formed me that I was able to hold up and examine this faith that was given to me. And I learned that there are more than one way, like there's more than one way to read the Bible. I learned about the power of black liberation theology and liberation theology and feminist theology and queer theology and eco theology and muharista theology. Like there was such a big, beautiful plethora of ways that we can bring our stories and our experiences to our faith and that they can inform each other in really beautiful ways. And it's actually in that setting where I came out to myself as a bisexual woman. And I really think it took me getting out from under all of the stuff that being a white person raised in the South was ingrained in me that gave me the space that when I was, it was really truly a spiritual and mystical experience for me to come out to myself. Um, it, it was literally a dark night. Um, I cried myself to sleep, but what happened was I 
was my eyes were open to myself, like, oh, you might be attracted to women too. And I, my, my, my tears and my fear was not about God. My tears and my fear were about the church. And I was already in the ordination process. And how were they going to respond to me sharing this other part of myself? Mm. And I wasn't sure, but, but God was there silently just welcoming me in against her breast and just saying, yeah, baby, I got you. <laughs> and so I, I share that to share part of my own faith and reproductive story. And to talk about what has shifted. As we mark the first year anniversary of Dobbs, as we're starting to call it, I need to shout out my good friend Glenn Northern at the National Council of Jewish Women for coming up with that. The Dobbs anniversary. we have to remember that the fall of Roe was not the beginning of this fight of reproductive oppression. We have to remember that SB8 went into effect in Texas on September 1, 2021. So abortion was already not accessible there. And, and before then, there is this is the result of a 40-year campaign led by white Christian nationalists seeking to co-opt a particular understanding of Christianity to further their political agenda. It is not of God. It does not come from God. It comes from the minds of political operatives, and they have successfully targeted and chipped away at at the freedoms and the rights that Roe provided for over those 40 years. And and so what has changed? Well, there was a lot that was, we knew this was coming. It it wasn't a surprise. It, It was a yeah, all right, we're here. What we saw was really an opening of the eyes of the entire country, recognizing that, yes, this is the reality that we are living in, unfortunately. And so one of the shifts is that people are taking my emails now. (laughs) People are signing up and are eager to get into this fight. And And I'm glad that they're there. And I hate why. I I hate the why. I hate that it took the fall of this very fundamental right for folks to pay attention and to start showing up. And and I hate that there are millions of women and pregnant people and birthing people who now have so much more to weigh as they're making decisions about how and when to get pregnant and how to Do they want to stay pregnant? What are their options for birthing? It's absolutely wild. You know, you mentioned that things were already happening. Rights Mm -hmm. were already be taken away. Friends of mine were just like, what is it going to take to get people in the streets? I don't know how you feel about this. It's been interesting to see the public opinion all of a sudden Mm -hmm. emerge. It was all very fun and and good to say, oh, I'm anti-abortion when you knew you could get an abortion. But then all of a sudden, like when, you know, when the rights were taken away, there were a lot of people who were like, oh, wait a second. No, this actually is not the country I want to live in. And we've Mm -hmm. seen polls that have really like all of a sudden become much clearer about the majority of Americans who Mm -hmm. really support uh, reproductive freedom and reproductive justice. Yes. What immediately come to mind is that there have been black women and indigenous women organizing for reproductive justice since 1994 and reproductive justice is the framework developed by black and indigenous women that holds to the four tenets, the human right to have a child, the human right not to have a child, the human right to parent the children we do have in safe and sustainable communities, and the human right to bodily autonomy. And so there's been a movement that has been sidelined and erased from the conversation, but has been around screaming all of this out for 30 years. And only now are we beginning to see, oh, that this might be a good strategy. And Mm. so I I'm thinking about those shifts and the ways that Black women have led in this space and have recognized that um, the right to abortion was not sufficient so long as you could not actually have access to the health care that you needed, whether that was 
safe and legal abortion care, or if that is a safe pregnancy. We're also knowing that the maternal health mortality rates are skyrocketing, especially for Black women all across this country. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a really important holistic framework that um, again doesn't doesn't talk just about birth, uh, but mm-hmm. talks about the broad you know the broad needs that surround um, carrying a child and then birthing a child and then raising a child. This is all part of a broader question and and the the, the ability to make decisions about your own life, the body bodily autonomy. I, where can people find you? I want to make sure that it, within the conversation yeah. that people are people are, we're going to say it more than once, but was tell what's the website? What's the best place for someone to find out more about sacred? So at sacred, you can find us at sacreddignity.org. That is our website that has everything about how to get involved with us, how to get your congregation involved in our work. On social media, we are at sacred underscore repro on Instagram and Twitter. On Facebook, we are just at sacred repro. Great. Now, tell me what congregations can do. I think it's really interesting that you have a congregation strategy. And I think we often just, because there's a perception, oh, religion is kind of dying out. Like, should we, I I feel like congregations still have a very important role at this Mm -hmm. moment in um, the religious life of the country, but also the potential of what congregations can do. Yes. Yes. How do congregations fit into your strategy? So the sacred congregations model is really inspired by faith-based institutional organizing that has happened for decades. And in particular, the work that has happened in around LGBTQ and faith inclusion in congregations. Across every religious tradition and denomination, there is some organization working for LGBTQ inclusion, ordination, marriage, celebration, all of that. And a lot of them have used this congregational designation model. And and so when we look, when we recognize that we've got to shift the culture around faith support for reproductive health rights and justice, the way that we're going to do that is by changing the hearts and minds. We also have to name that we are here marking the one year anniversary of the Dobbs decision. And we just have to say outright, that means that our movement lost. And our movement lost because there was not an integrated faith strategy that informed and supported. We we know that our folks um, uh, opposed to abortion, opposed to reproductive rights, opposed to life and flourishing of all people and families in this country are rooting their message in a particular religious language, a particular religious framework. And so in order to organize against that, we have got to get into our faith-based congregations. And, And for far too long, particularly I come from the mainline tradition, we've just fallen silent. We said, well, that's that's an issue for those folks over there. And where has that gotten us? It has gotten us to where we've got tens of 12 or 20 states where abortion is completely banned. And we're watching news coverage come out every day of more and more of our rights getting chipped away. So what do sacred congregations do? Sacred congregations engage in our seven session curriculum that we have created, which is creates a process for folks to dig in deep, to address all of these issues of stigma and all of these hot topics. I say, if you don't even know how many buttons you have, but if there is a button to push within you, this curriculum will find it and push it. (laughs) But, but it enables folks to, to do that work in their own faith community where they already have relationships. So then they can better show up to support the movements that are happening in their communities, in their states. Uh, We've got our first ever sacred congregation is First Unitarian Universalist of Sarasota. And they went through the curriculum and then voted to become a sacred congregation. And Florida is a political hotspot right now. I don't know if you know that, Paul. <laughs> uh, I really do tell. No, but what I like about this is that also uh, it signifies something. Like with LGBTQI yes. churches, 
you know, what, one of the things, I mean, I have, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a husband and two kids and it means something to me when a congregation has yes. decided to publicly say, we welcome you. I mean, it yes. actually does mean something to me because I feel like I don't have to be freaked out to walk into this congregation. And I think yeah. for congregations to become designated as sacred congregations or places where people can, you know, speak openly about reproductive health care and uh, abortion justice, reproductive justice, this this will mean something to people who are looking for a congregation where they can feel at home and yes. possibly, you know, stay a while. And I think so like, yeah. in, so, you know, in, in the Christian church, we might call it like evangelizing or something mm-hmm. like that, you know, like in other congregations, it would be a different word, but it, it it's a way of showing to the world, like, this is actually what we stand for. We've done the work. We invite yes. you in. So this congregation in Florida, they voted and already have an organized reproductive justice action team and have already plugged in with their local movement. And there is a ballot initiative to get abortion protection on the ballot in November. And what's clear, what we've seen across this country is that when you put abortion on the ballot, it wins. This is all so smart. And what I really just want to like note is like the deep spiritual commitment mm-hmm that you, you know, just comes from, you know, every word you're saying and the, and the, the grounding of this work that often, you know, gets painted as super like harsh and, and it, there's like a way that we can be, you know, we can be a place we can offer, you know, health, spiritual health, mental health, physical health mm-hmm. to the, you know, mm-hmm. to our country. And I, I just, I love the way you're talking about it. I, I want to take just one minute to just, what about contraception? It almost, all, all of a sudden, it seems like contraception is on the table for a lot of these anti, you know, mm-hmm. people who are trying to take away our rights to make decisions about our bodies. You know, are you all looking at efforts to ban contraception? Yeah. So when it comes to the issues of contraception, we're, we're seeing play out what we always knew was going to happen. Overturning Roe was not the end of this work to control women's bodies, to limit the autonomy of pregnant people, and to hamstring medical providers who seek to offer compassionate care. No matter what the courts say, medication abortion is still safe, effective, and accessible for now. And even if this mifepristone ban goes into effect, it still will not eliminate access to abortion. It will, however, make accessing reproductive care overall more difficult and increases poor maternal and reproductive health outcomes. And we have to be clear that this is still coming from that same driving force of white Christian nationalism. It's an unholy marriage of the particular understanding of Christianity with authoritarian political power. And I've got to speak to you, Paul, and to all of your audience that as a white Christian Presbyterian pastor, the Jesus that I follow is not authoritarian. (laughs) The Jesus I know does not shame, judge, or stigmatize people and their reproductive decisions. This Jesus teaches us to love God, to love each other, and to love ourselves. Mm. Period. Mm. Yeah. Period. Period. I love it. P- p- please preach to me anytime. Thank you. For- I need it. Listen, I'm standing in the need of prayer. I can't help but thinking like we have this idea of the moral arc of the universe and it's bending towards justice and it's all going to be OK. And as queer people, we right now I'm kind of like, huh, it seems like things are going in a good direction. But, you know, th- what what I see as like the power of things to be reversed and the permission that's being granted out there right now to kind of say terrible things and do terrible things. How does the work that you've seen or the trajectory that you've seen on uh, reproductive rights uh, track with LGBTQI rights and the way that we can expect to live freely in this country? Yeah, yeah. In some ways, it's not a surprise. I would say that the LGB movement, the gay and lesbian movement, sort of has left behind trans folks historically. 
And, and we're seeing the fruits of that now. And, and we're seeing exposing the weaknesses and, and the attacks on trans children on trans families, on trans performers seeking to make a good life for themselves, being artists and creators. And again, it all comes from the same driving force of white Christian nationalism. These are the same people, the same entities, the same dark money driving restrictions of uh, our, our bodily autonomy, both in the reproductive realm and in our LGBTQ gender affirming care realm. So we have to be clear about that. And what the faith movement has to offer in this moment is a deeper grounding. You said the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. And we have to co-create <laughs> that bending with God. Right. It does not happen on its own. We are watching the, the demons of white supremacy and patriarchy rearing up their heads because they know the time is nigh. Mm. I, I do think a lot of that movement, the, the, you know, we talk a lot in this show about white Christian nationalism and, and the driving force of fear. And what mm. fear, like, you know, this sense of lack of control, we, we're not be able to control anymore. And, you know, and I, I just, you know, I do, I, I do, I think that's a spiritual malaise it's in itself. And if there's a way that, you know, we could reach, you know, I, I really, like, I try to imagine, like, what could we do, what could I do to assure people that I'm, you know, the fact of my existence does not have to threaten your existence. And the fact that other people might make different choices do not, does not have to threaten your choice that you want to make. You know, there's, there's a fear factor and it, that's leading to a control impulse and an authoritarian impulse that is, um, is really suffocating our democracy. Well, and it's because liberation is such a threat. Mm. Flourishing is a threat. Thriving is a threat. We have yeah. got to stay focused on what is the end goal? What is the vision of the world that we want to live in, the world that we want to create, the world that God helps us to create is a vision of life and abundance and flourishing and liberation yeah. where the chains are thrown off. And so we've got to come together and resist wherever someone else is trying to put more chains on us. Right. Right. I love that. That is a great way not to complete or end this conversation, but to pause it until the next time we get to talk. I just appreciate so much what you're doing. I also know that you have a great group of collaborators that you, no one is doing this on their own. We need one another. Yes, we are so grateful to work with wonderful folks such as Catholics for Choice, Faith Choice Ohio, Faith in Women in Mississippi, Heart Women and Girls, National Council of Jewish Women, New Mexico Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, and the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice. We also work with some amazing denominations like the Unitarian Universalist Association and their Side with Love campaign, the National Ministries of the United Church of Christ. And we love working with Faith Allowed, which is a has an all options um, clergy counseling line for folks needing care. And this year, to mark the anniversary of the Dobbs decision, we have put together a resource amplifying the calls to action of Sacred and all of these organizations. Go to sacreddignity.org to find that document and learn how to connect with all of us. The Reverend Angela Tyler Williams is co-director for Movement Building at Sacred, Spiritual Alliance of Communities for Reproductive Dignity. Follow and support their work at sacreddignity.org. Angela, thank you so much for being with us, for your pastoral presence, for all of your wisdom and your encouragement towards liberation. I offer you uh, my own encouragement back to you and also wish you a happy Pride and happy Fourth of July. Thank you, Paul. It was really good to be with you. 
Coming up next, Sophie hersher Andofsky and Aaron Dorfman from the Jewish Partnership for Democracy. If you miss any part of today's program, you can hear full episodes of State of Belief anytime on our website. And please make sure you subscribe to the Next Generation Podcast. Please go to stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. That's stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. You're listening to State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet. Welcome back to State of Belief. I'm Interfaith Alliance President, Reverend Paul Brandeis Rauschenbusch. A more perfect union, the Jewish Partnership for Democracy exists to build and support a robust, well-resourced, transpartisan Jewish coalition working together to strengthen democracy. It's a bold mission, but essential for the moment we're living in, with unprecedented threats to structures we've been able to take for granted until now. With sophisticated analysis of the 2020 vote and lessons to apply to 2024, I'm very happy to welcome Executive Director Aaron Dorfman and Sophie hersher Andofsky, Vice President for Strategy and Communications, to State of Belief. Thanks so much, Paul. Really thrilled to Thank be here. Thank you. Great to be here. So talk to me about a more perfect union, a Jewish partnership for democracy. I love every word of that title, but can you illuminate a little bit what's involved in that? Sure, sure. I'm happy to take that. Um, a more perfect union, the Jewish partnership for democracy launched in uh, January of 2022, um, uh, sort of out of, a, out of an awareness that uh, uh, American Jews, Jews in America, have it better than Jews have had it anywhere else in the diaspora in the last 2000 years. Uh, we have built a thriving Jewish community in this country, Jewish education, cultural institutions, advocacy institutions, um, social service agencies, uh, uh, synagogues, like really unbelievably vibrant um, Jewish civilization in this country. And that uh, our ability to, to, to do that has been primarily based on American democracy, the container that American democracy affords for, uh, for us as a, a very small religious minority in this country to, to thrive. Um, and that container, I'd say that the sort of second big insight is that that container of democracy with its commitment to the rule of law and freedom of association and protection for religious minorities is equally important for the ultra-Orthodox religious right and the ultra-secular religious left in our community. So all of us um, depend on it, and uh, it's in our collective enlightened self-interest uh, to try to preserve, protect, and strengthen it. So that's, uh, the, that's the kind of the, I love the, the that. background I love story that. behind it. I reference sometimes my great grandfather, Louis Brandeis, who I think would exactly agree with you that he was so committed to the idea of American democracy and felt like really part of his mission was to support and strengthen American democracy. I think that's just a, a powerful um, project for the Jewish people and um, and wonderful. So so tell me some of the. Um, the insights that you have gained in just a couple of years. I didn't realize you kind of just started. So what do you know now and what are you hoping to learn? That's a great question. So when we first launched in 2022, we launched with a specific focus on ensuring free, fair, safe and accessible elections and really, really trying to figure out what was the Jewish community's comparative advantage in doing so. So we know that there are sort of an infinite number of things that could help support American elections. We wanted to know what our community was best resourced and best positioned to do. Um, and so what we've learned is a lot about where there is resourcing, where there is willingness, where there is resistance, where there is fear, where there is momentum, and where there is opportunity. 
those have sort of our insights all sort of fall within that framework. Um, and we now actually we've expanded to four strategic priorities, but we still have that elections focus dip in there because we've learned that the Jewish community really, really cares about free, fair, safe and accessible elections. And there is an incredible amount of infrastructure inside of kind of the larger Jewish community to respond to a whole bunch of different policy positions. Um, and there wasn't anyone who was talking about the container that Aaron was just mentioning, uh, the process of democracy itself, we were all taking for granted that it would always be there. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of our main takeaways has been that it's very scary for people to confront the possibility that that container is not immutable. Um, and that right. every generation carries the responsibility to be that sort of founding generation, to have that founding ethos to sort of reinforce and renew the institutions that that allow us to have a voice in how we're governed and how we live. You're mentioning like the Jewish people are invested. I'll speak for, for my own self. Like I think the Jewish people are invested in democracy for everyone, not just for the Jewish people. And I think that's part of what I, you know, I'm hearing you say is that this is this is work that is important for all of us. And the Jewish people, like all of us, have a specific role and to identify that role and know how we, they, you are going to show up for our democracy. And I, I love that project because I think it's actually something that we should all be thinking about. How will how will we show up for our democracy from our various faith traditions? Do you have like specific like tenants within the Jewish tradition or the Jewish people that you say, this is why we have to show up or is it more just self-evident? Um, I love that question. We get, we get asked that question a lot. Um, and we we actually, when we launched, uh, made a very intentional decision not to invoke a set of Jewish values or principles as the as the sort of rationale for the founding principles of our work. And and the reason for that is because uh, uh, is like like every great religious tradition, the Jewish tradition is rife with tension. And one can look into the Jewish tradition and find all kinds of amazing rationales and justifications and support for democracy. And one can look inside of it and find all kinds of rationalizations and justifications for monarchy and uh, uh, the leadership of a priestly class and right, all yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. And furthermore, our American Jewish community, when it looks into our tradition, it's it, it high, like different parts of our community highlight all kinds of different elements of that tradition in their uh, and invoke it in, in their defense of and support for democracy from, um, you know, a deep commitment to human rights to uh, a, a deep commitment to religious freedom to support for capitalism to support for a social welfare state. And we didn't want to like we didn't want to go right. choosing our favorite yeah, children. Big tent, yeah, yeah. Big tent. If you start with if you if you start with Tikkun Olam, there's like a, a already like people are like oh oh well I know who they are. You know I exactly. I I I, was, I totally respect that. I part of the reason that I was so eager to have both of you on is that I was a, I was on a call where there were you presented some findings that you've done because you're also you also do research you also do like you're trying to learn as much as you can share as much as you can and so i i'm curious if, if could you share some of the highlights from what you've learned from 2020 that we can those are kind of things that we can hold on to and and help them help them help us propel us into the future Absolutely. Um, and I will say that a lot of our research is aggregated from other incredible folks who are doing the work. So I will make sure to name those people and give them credit for the, the great work that they do. Um, and the, the research that we've done sort of started with 2020, it took us into 2022, all been in service in helping us sort of get through 2024 so that we can really start the work of sort of envisioning what our next, you know, 100, 250 years looks like. Um, so the first, the first thing that I always mention when people ask me this question um, is that we've had the highest proportionate voter turnout in the past two elections, respectively, than any other time in American history. So the most amount of people proportionately are voting than ever before. Um, and what's really interesting about that is depending on who you ask, that's either a really good thing or kind of a bad thing. Uh, because what you have historically is a trend that shows 
that when you have extraordinarily high percentages of, of people voting, it tends to mean that there are rifts in the social fabric. It tends to mean that people are showing up to vote against something instead of showing up to vote for something. And I was recently speaking with Sarah Longwell, who is, I think she would probably call herself a never Trump Republican. That's probably how she would describe herself. Uh, she's the editor of a news source called The Bulwark. Um, and she said that when people ask her, how will you know that the danger has passed? And she will say, when people stop voting in the numbers that they are, we will wow. have some sense that the danger has passed. So I like to put that out there because that's not to say people should or shouldn't vote. Uh, that's just to say that not everything is as it seems right now. Um, the second thing that's really important to understand is that state legislatures are in an absolute election reform frenzy right now. Um, I just pulled the numbers before this call and it looks like there are eight, 1,834 bills, election reform bills currently going through state legislatures. This number is from the Voting Rights Lab. Um, and that is made up of 390 bills that would restrict voter access or election administration and 869 that would improve or expand voter access or election administration. And, you know, I can't make a value judgment on what that means in aggregate because all of those policies are different and would have different implications and every state is wildly distinct. Um, but what it means is that the rules of the game are not set yet for 2024. And that creates a really um, sort of interesting, challenging um, environment for election officials to prepare for. Um, those who are actually on the front lines of our elections, those sort of civil servants or political appointees, or in some cases, elected officials who run our elections, they don't know what kinds of elections they're going to be running yet. And that's not great. Um, and it means that they yeah. need a lot of community support and they need a lot of engagement at the state level. You know, a lot of Americans are really hyper focused at the federal level right now. Oh, and the reality yeah. is when you talk about democracy, you have to look at your state. Yeah. Um, you have uh, to, to pay to attention. Again, to quote, uh, you know, Brandeis, uh, states are laboratories of democracy. That's where that's where we work it out. And uh, this is really this is all so bracing. Uh, OK, keep going. Keep going. Absolutely. Um, I will say, you know, I guess I was hoping to get more more positive, but I'll, I'll continue in my current vein for just a second, which is to say um, there's a real, real need to support the election administrators that I was just talking about. You know, if you look at um, data produced from the Brennan Center for Justice, there's some really stark numbers out there about election officials. Most election officials, like I said, are civil servants, their their career um career folks and we're looking at about 20 percent one in five considering leaving their job before the 2024 election because of this sort of drastic increase in threats in intimidation in media attention um, i would draw everyone's attention to the washington post article that came out a few weeks ago about bill gates who is the chairman of the board of supervisors of maricopa county in phoenix scottsdale in arizona who is coming out publicly with having ptsd from all of the attention and abuse he got after the 2022 elections um i always like to remind people that the majority of election officials are women and when abuse mm. and harassment is directed at women it compounds sort of partisan intentions and so you get you get gender-based threats. And when you have yeah. women of color, you get gender and race-based threats. Uh, so, you know, these issues really intersect with a lot of other things that were happen that are happening out in the world. And the, the real challenge here is that if these people leave their jobs, we will have a presidential election expecting the highest voter turnout in American history with people who don't know how to do the job enforcing laws that just got passed down right so it's kind of a triple whammy these things build on oh themselves my God. And, yeah but the but the good news is there's actually a lot we can do i mean there's so much that we okay can do now as... give it to us this is a yeah. this is a solution-based show so let, let let us know what we can do come on absolutely um so i like to talk about supporting elections and election administrators in a supply and demand framework. I think there's two ways to think about it. And I actually think this is the perfect venue to talk about it because I've worked in faith-based organizing 
for more than a decade. I started my career at the Interfaith Alliance as a as an intern, an undergraduate, um, and I've seen a lot of faith organizations do great work around elections, and it's always on the demand side. And when I mean the de- when I say the demand side, I mean voting. Voting is a very important part of elections, but it is not the only part of elections. So religious organizations, faith-based organizations, spiritual organizations do great work around voting rights, voter mobilization, voter education, uh, candidate forums, election protection, and all that work is amazing. And right now, we are we are confronting a real need on the supply side of elections for support from community-based organizations. And that can look like a lot of different things. It can look like supporting uh, election officials by recruiting poll workers. That's a huge, huge need. It's one of the first needs we hear when we talk to election officials. It can mean recruiting seasonal election workers, um, especially you know young people or even retired folks, but folks who can work in the warehouses and drive the trucks and sort of be part of the actual mechanisms of running an election because elections start like four months before an, we think an election runs and they go about a month after. These are paid positions that people can do um, with their county. There's also uh, supporting election officials in like the true communal sense of the word. I recently spoke with with someone at the at the uh, Association of Election Officials, and she said, if you live in a place where this makes sense, bake a pie. Bake a pie, bake brownies, have your Sunday school um, write thank you cards, take your chalk outside their buildings. Uh-huh and decorate the street and say thank you because these people are overworked, they're underappreciated, and in many cases, they're actually under threat. They're this receiving. Is, yeah, this is so important. And I, I do want, I want our listeners, all of you to take this seriously because this is something that we can do. It doesn't seem to me that it, this is an either or. You can be part of both of these pieces of work. I'll make it super simple for me, which is like, it's loving your neighbor. I mean, you know, if if, if nothing else, it's loving your neighbor who's showing up for us in a way that is really crucial for our democracy and being there for them. And even if you don't agree with them politically, that's not the point. The point is, is that we're all in our democracy with one another. And so these are these are really important ways that we can show up for one another. And I really appreciate that. Going forward, like, how will we know if 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 we're rallying in the right way, and and what way can people learn about the resources that you offer in helping us do that rallying? Uh, I think that one of the things that characterizes this last decade or so in the United States, and this last fifteen years since the kind of the global high water mark of democracy in two thousand eight, is the sense of urgency and emergency around uh, around democracy. And, um, you know, there there isn't a binary indicator that's going to say, OK, we're in the clear, right? Like authoritarianism and anti-democratic sentiment are, are drifting away and democracy is safe and stable again. Democracies don't work like that, right? Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor talked about how uh, democracy needs to be relearned. Civic engagement needs to be relearned in every generation. So I think like from my vantage point, the indicator for us is that this becomes a, a part of what we do as as our as our work as citizens. Um, we see civics education reestablished in in American public schools in a way that it has been in decline for the last generation. We see voting rates. I don't know if I'm I, I'm not sure I, I'm with Sarah Longwell that uh, that we want to see voting rates go down. I'd like to see voting rates stabilize at a high level that isn't reactive and voting against, but it's that people are highly politically engaged and um, voting regularly and consistently um, and believing that their vote matters because the people they elect, they hold accountable for delivering on the things that they promise. That we see reductions in the kind of toxic polarization that characterizes so much of our political discourse now, that our anxieties about misinformation and disinformation dissipate, that um, uh, the the decline in local journalism reverses, and we figure out alternative pathways to to providing highly effective investigative journalism that holds governments accountable and provides people with the information they need in order to exercise their citizenship responsibly. So I, I wish I could say there were you know three indicators that if they went the other way, we'd know we were out of this. No, th- those um, those all make total sense to me. I think one of the one of the things I'm most disturbed about. Uh, frankly, is 
the persistence, and you mentioned misinformation, disinformation, but just the temptation that has been succumbed to just to say, no, I didn't lose. This is a terrible trend. You think about what Al Gore did in 2000 and said, okay, okay, I could fight this for another decade and I I would have a right to do that. But I'm going to say no, for the good of America, I'm going to concede. I'm not saying whether it was the right thing, but it was it was a decent moment. And yet we have other people and, you know, the, the former president who still, even though he knows, I mean, he knows and everyone around him knows that he lost. He won't concede. How do we how do we instill that in our politicians that we we expect that we expect like for Democrats, Republicans, anybody, if you lose, say you lost and concede for the for the benefit of our democracy and run again. You can win again. Like, you know, that, you know, Reagan lost for years before Reagan won. I mean, it doesn't mean run again. I I just think like that's that to me is this huge elephant that's sitting on all of us right now. And I uh, how how do we deal with that? I I, I, and I'll I'll sweeten it to say, like, give me some Jewish wisdom on how to deal with that, because (laughs) I feel like I'm I'm, I don't have any wisdom right now about it. Aside aside from just uh, frustration. I will invoke some wisdom, although I'll, I'll come at the Jewish part of it sideways. Um, one of our strategic advisors, the kind of extraordinary executive director of the, the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University, Hari Han, Dr. Hari Han, has this amazing line that I feel like has become a touchstone for us in our work, which is that the clearest indicator of a healthy democracy is one in which people are willing to sacrifice certainty about ends in exchange for certainty about means. In other words, if people have confidence that the process works and is fair, right, they'll accept that they may lose on a particular right. on a particular policy fight because they can come back the next day with their interlocutor across the table who holds by the same set of rules and they will tussle and compromise and negotiate and win and lose again. And uh, I think, frankly, like that to me is a, a central um, tenet of, of the Jewish wisdom tradition, which is that in, in a lot of ways, uh, for us, process is much more important than product, right? The deliberative process of mm-hmm. sitting with a study partner over a text and working through it. The process of Jewish legal um, uh, evolution in response to emerging circumstance, like those are the things that uh, in many ways are sacrosanct in Jewish tradition, much more so than uh, than the particular rules around a dietary constraint or a, a, a Sabbath observance constraint. Um, and I think in that way, there's there's real um, uh, theological or, or philosophical alignment between the Jewish enterprise and the American enterprise, the American democratic enterprise. And um, that's, that's certainly a piece of, of what inspires and animates us in this work. That was, uh, that was lovely. And I, I really appreciate that. I, I want to, we, we ask everybody uh, at this point in the conversation, what gives you hope? And so uh, I'll ask both of you that. Uh, what gives, Sophie, what gives you hope? You know, when I, when I first started this job, I was worried that it was going to mess with my mental health. Um, and I found that the more that I learn, the more hopeful that I feel. Um, The United States is the longest running constitutional democracy in human history. No one's done it longer than we have. So it was always going to be hard. Um, I think that if if there's anything that gives me hope, it would be that we're we're starting to be willing to embrace the fact that it's not easy and live into that instead of sort of relying on this this sort of uh, oversimplified narrative that that America is the culmination of all human progress. And by Mm. nature, we must have established the city upon a hill and thus it is perfect. That's never who we were. And the sooner that we that we really understand that it's ours to build, the more hopeful I will be. Thank you. I want to also, you know, I I recognize that you um, you knew uh, Welton and and worked with Welton and, and just if you had a had a memory or, or something you wanted to say about Welton, I'd love to hear it. Absolutely. And and thank you for the opportunity to to share that. It's it's really sort of a 
a, a really wonderful moment to get to speak to you today um, and to feel sort of to, to honor his memory. Um, the thing that sticks out to me the most about him is that I came to I came to intern at the Interfaith Alliance being a a Jewish girl from an urban part of California who went to college in Seattle. And I had a really specific idea of what I thought Baptists were and what I thought sort of Southern Christians were or had to be. And he was the first person whose friendship taught me that my biases were just as bad as everybody else else's and that I needed to listen to people tell me who they were before I decided who they were. Um, and that was an incredible gift he gave me that I will be grateful for for always. That's a that's a wonderful testimony, uh, Aaron. Tell me tell me what gives you hope. Um, I'll just I just want to echo uh, Sophie's thoughts about Welton. I did not know Welton, but um, uh, from what I have read about about him and his work, um, I just want to say you know in, in our tradition the, the the phrase that comes to mind is Yichrona Libraham, may his memory be for a blessing um, for you and for all the people his his work touched. Um, I'd say the thing that gives me hope is this kind of remarkable uh, generativity and creativity among the partners and people that we get to work with around the, the American Jewish community and the, um, the like fascinating uh, um, innovations that they're bringing to bear in the context of their communities and institutions in response to this moment of democratic precarity. There's a rabbi outside of Washington, D.C who has um, instituted you know what for many american jews is a completely wild thing but from my vantage point is just brilliant um once a month uh, as part of uh, their their shabbat morning torah study instead of studying the weekly torah portion they study a canonical text of american democracy so they look mm -hmm. at federalist 10 or they look at um uh um, you know, the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation or Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail um, and, and read it with the same um, uh, textual analysis that we bring to bear on Jewish texts uh, out of an acknowledgement, both of the, like, the importance of those texts, but also an awareness that American Judaism is a particular thing in a particular place and draws you know, much of its um, resonance and, and legitimacy and viability and, and uh, authenticity from the American context as it does from the Jewish context. And, you know, Jewish schools that are that are figuring out how to bring uh, a, a, a religiously rooted but um, democratically pluralistic civics education into their classrooms. Um, uh, Jewish institutions that are aware of the ways that toxic polarization is um, not only present between the Jewish community and other communities, but also inside the Jewish community around highly divisive issues and working to figure out how to build our, uh, our muscles around disagreeing with each other constructively, embracing viewpoint diversity and pluralism as a, as a source of strength and resilience as opposed to a, a source of divisiveness and, and fragility. So there's just amazing work happening all over the all over the American Jewish community that inspires me and gives me a lot of hope. And, you know, I hope that we can continue to um, catalyze and support it and also uh, uh, make sure that it's disseminated and available as widely as possible. Aaron Dorfman is executive director at A More Perfect Union, a Jewish partnership for democracy. Sophie Hersher-Andofsky is Vice President for Strategy and Communications at The Partnership, as well as Founder and Chief Strategist at Grandview Strategies. What a promising vision. Thank you both for being with us on The State of Belief. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you so much. And that's all the time we have for this week's State of Belief. Starting this month, we've partnered with Religion News Service, the leading religion journalism organization in the country, for distribution and expansion of our show. We hope the important conversations we produce each week will reach new audiences and contribute even more to the search for strategies and solutions to the very real challenges facing our nation. Please be sure to subscribe to the new and improved podcast called The State of Belief at Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Or go to stateofbelief.com slash new podcast. We've got so much planned for the weeks and months ahead, and I don't want you to miss out. Subscribe to The State of Belief today. We need your help keeping State of Belief on the air. 
I hope you'll consider being a partner in this crucial work by making a financial contribution today. Information on how to donate is available at stateofbelief.com. That's stateofbelief.com. And you can also be part of making sure informative and encouraging voices like these are heard by sharing this program with friends and family. Let's get more people listening and more people taking part both on and off the air. And join the conversation. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter at State of Belief and share State of Belief with the people in your life. State of Belief is produced by Ray Kirstein and is a production of Interfaith Alliance. Become a member today at interfaithalliance.org. And be sure to join us next week. I can't wait. Until then, I'm Paul Rauschenbusch on the State of Belief, where religion and democracy meet.